Welcome to Legends, a series that delves into the lore within Horizon Forbidden West. In this exploration, we can finally unravel the origins, purpose, and eventual fate of the metal flowers that can be found across Horizon's world. Though they first appeared after the fall of Gaia, their beginnings trace all the way back to the 21st century, intertwined with innovations that would lead to total extinction. On the California coast, for much of the 2040s, the Faro Automated Solutions industry-leading biotech research facility, known as the Greenhouse, had been pursuing solutions to global food shortages brought on by the climate crisis of the previous decade. In 2043, scientist Tala Aquino would begin her work to aid the starving masses the world over. At first, the research was wide-reaching to find answers while the world fearfully waited. Many results were promising, but in the eyes of Ted Farrow, some simply wouldn't make the cut. Even after months of research and investment into areas like insect protein alternatives, Ted would abandon projects where he knew his company would face the greatest competition. All advancements made in these scrapped endeavors would not only be left incomplete, but would not be shared to aid others in solving this dire crisis. Instead, FAS would double down on plant gene sequencing, that would define their contributions to feeding the world. There, the Pharaoh Harvester line was created, along with the systems they would work in tandem with. Unlike the approach of some competitors in green robotics, the company under Pharaoh's stewardship insisted that their technology, by design, be optimized with other FAS tech, increasing profits over the competition despite the desperate need of the masses. Morality of the situation notwithstanding, the FAS farming units were truly a marvel of innovation. Each unit capable of infield analysis of soil composition, light intensity, wind speed, temperature, and several hundred other variables. With this data, these machines could then use gene sequencing technology to select, manipulate, or construct a plant to produce the best possible yield for the specific location. Advances such as these would address much of the world's food insecurity while tripling the profits of FAS during the 2040s. Even with this success in green robotics, Pharaoh would pivot away from this sector in the next decade, and those working at the greenhouse would have to turn their talents towards other endeavors. Those like Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck and Marjane Nafisi would resign their respective posts during this period of transition in the late 2040s. One such project responsible for such division was the development of a new kind of energy production. Specifically, biomass conversion. Those in opposition viewed this as investing in the destruction of life rather than preservation and restoration that had previously defined the corporation. Its adopters saw this as simply the next evolution in energy, a revolutionary method to release solar energy that was captured organically with the potential to provide infinite fuel for infinite machines. This kind of optimism, despite the potential for military application, kept those like Aquino working on the project, as the potential was simply too great to succumb to what might happen. She would go on to quote Marie Curie in a personal log, giving greater perspective to her inner justifications. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so that we may fear less. Tragically, the result of these innovations would be worse than anyone may have feared. Biomass conversion would be successfully developed, and eventually be adapted for Pharaoh's most advanced robotic peacekeepers to date, the Chariot Line. Harnessing the power of nanotech, these machines could now sustain themselves anywhere biomass was available in their chosen theater. Though only intended for emergency use, this would set Chariot Line machines far above their competitors in the realm of in-field survivability. This paired with near impregnable security systems and the ability to self-replicate would create the perfect formula for total extinction in the 21st century. In 2064, the swarm belonging to the Hearts Timor Energy Combine stopped responding to stand-down orders. This glitch would be the beginning of the Pharaoh Plague, as chariot line machines began consuming all organic matter in their wake, replicating at a pace that would consume all life in 15 months. This realization would lead to several key events in the Horizon timeline. Headed by Dr. Sobek would be Project Zero Dawn, a terraforming system that would return life to a barren Earth 
after the swarm had been deactivated. For the future consortium Far Zenith, they would redouble their efforts to ensure the Odyssey colony ship would be ready to depart the Earth's orbit for the Sirius system before Zero Day arrived. General Aaron Harris and the U.S. Joint Chiefs would initiate Operation Enduring Victory, a global campaign pitting humanity against the swarm. Though defeat was inevitable, the goal was to slow the swarm to buy enough time for ZD to be completed. This along with yet another project that was aimed to stop the swarm in its tracks, headed by those who had an intimate knowledge of what powered them. At the greenhouse, Tala Aquino and her team tapped into their expertise in plant-based gene sequencing. Together, they set to work on adamantine wreath, a system that if successful, would be able to ensnare pharaoh machines in mass and eventually starve the swarm into submission. In the very facility FAS biomass conversion had been developed, its silver bullet was refined. Within, the breakthrough Aquino had hoped for was achieved. Near indestructible vines, modified to be completely immune to the swarm's nanohaze and strong enough to halt their advance. In short, the wreaths worked. Regrettably, it would be other logistical challenges that would put salvation for humanity out of reach. By the time Adamantine Wreath was ready, and systems developed for survivors to destroy the vines after their purpose had been fulfilled, the swarm's reproduction would outpace the ability to drop deployment shells to counter their advance by 375%. To add further insult to injury, even if deployment had been able to keep pace with swarm production, the very systems designed to keep the wreaths in check for humanity would have eventually been used by the swarm to free themselves. Along with abilities mentioned previously, the chariot line were apex predators in the field of hacking enemy technology. In this, given enough time, the swarm would have eventually manipulated the deployment shells into using its own failsafe protocols, accessing the coded keys designed to trigger the enzyme for wreaths to consume themselves from within. Though a valiant effort, Adamantine Wreath, it seems, was always doomed to fail. And for the next several centuries, its legacy and origins would be forgotten. Only until the events of the extinction signal sent to Gaia Prime in the year 3020 would this technology be resurrected. After the AI's destruction, her subordinate function charged with flora repopulation and environmental stabilization, Demeter, fled to the data core of the ancient greenhouse facility. There, confused and paranoid, it would adopt this technology, believing another pharaoh plague to be imminent, and use the means at its disposal to prevent this from coming to pass. Using dread wings, the shells would be dropped across the world, in preparation for this second plague, in hopes it could protect the world's plant life. First studied by a Nutaru botanist, the discovered deployment shells would be dubbed as metal flowers to those in the 31st century. Though much of what we see with the metal flowers is a byproduct of the original project, its interaction with the meter altered its code in rather unique ways. Influenced by its alpha, Tanaka Naoto, who in life was a great lover of poetry, Demeter in its newfound sentience began to manifest a similar affection within the metal flowers. Code fragments containing writings of the old ones, and machine dreams often containing themes of dread and worry. Only after Aloy utilized the wreath's code key to access, then reunite the subfunction with Gaia, was it returned to its original code using Dr. Sobek's master override. There, its fears and worries were finally put to rest, being part of the terraforming system once again. Even with Demeter being returned to Gaia, there's no way of telling just how many metal flowers it was able to deploy during its 20-year time frame in the greenhouse. So, it's quite likely that as we continue Aloy's journey, we will find these metal flowers in the last legacy of ancient technology that is Adamantine Wreath. And that brings our journey to an end. I'd like to say a special thanks to Forbidden West narrative director Ben McCaw for taking the time to clarify some facts that were integral to this exploration. We here in the lore community really appreciate it. If you'd like to see more content like this, likes and shares are always appreciated. And if you're really hungry for more Horizon lore, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of our lore library. 
Also consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can keep making content just like this. Check out the link in the description. And as always, thanks for watching and keep questing.